In southeast Texas along the San Antonio River is the small town of Goliad. But when you look at its position in the history of Texas and the history of Mexico and everything that went on in the relations between the two countries, it is anything but small. It is well known for a number of significant events, including the birthplace of a Mexican general, a major massacre, colonialization, and, you know, basically a number of different countries, including France and Spain, also trying to get a hold on their territory there. So, yeah, it actually has quite a bit of history. We'll try to get into a little bit of that history without overwhelming you, uh, but because it does play such a big role, we found it well worth the visit and think that it's worth a stop if you have a chance. We stayed for the weekend at Goliad State Park, and be prepared to have your brain filled, maybe not necessarily from this video, but while you are spending a weekend in that area, because there is so much history and so many different things to see. So let's start with kind of the, the focal point of everything that got that area started, which was the mission, the Mission Espirito Santo. I'm saying that for you, <laughs> so you don't have to try. Hopefully I got it pretty close. Uh, and that is a key feature of the state park now. This particular mission was built in 1749 uh, and is one of many Spanish missions that were built in that era. The Alamo is actually one such mission and, and as you drive around in that area, you'll see a handful of them that are in various states of disrepair or that have been you know, reconstructed. In this particular mission's case, it's a pretty good hybrid of the chapel part has been reconstructed and that was done in the 1930s by the Civilian Conservation Corps, but the rest of the grounds are still as in the disrepair that they were. So the, the rock walls are crumbling, the rest of the buildings are gone, there, there's a handful of foundations left. Um, and that's kind of nice because you can kind of at least see the, the concept of like what the outline of the grounds would be, but you still get to see the mission chapel and what that would have looked like because that would have been the full Focal point during the time uh, when the mission was actually in use. And we should probably give, maybe if you don't know anything about the Spanish missions, uh, these were built to spread um, Catholicism and, you know, super happy colonialism period <laughs> that, you know, that everybody wanted to think that the natives were bad and they needed to, you know, be Catholic. Um, and in this particular case, actually many of the natives did come in and live within the mission walls because the natives were all warring against each other. And so in this particular case, the natives who lived within those walls were protected from other warring tribes. So this gave them a sense of security, food, shelter, you know, it, a livelihood. They planted crops, they helped with cattle. And, and so they actually lived there for a number of years, you know, and kind of helped the mission become, I wouldn't say profitable, but it ended up with one of the, the first and largest cattle herds in early Texan history. And if you get a chance, there are guided tours available from the rangers, and we took one, and we actually got a chance to go with the superintendent because he, he says he tries to do them periodically just to keep up with his history, so it was kind of fun that we got to go with the superintendent of the park who really knows his stuff there. And a couple of interesting things he brought up. One was, as you mentioned, in the 30s, the Civilian Conservation Corps came in, and the original plan was to restore the entire mission, all of the walls and buildings and everything, but they simply ran out of time. Now, mm -hmm. they did a really good job in rebuilding the the chapel, I guess is what, what it would be called, but um, so it looks very much like it would have at the time, and it was done. They taught the CCC boys that were working there how to do things the old-fashioned way, like way old-fashioned way from the 1700s, doing everything by hand. So they did a nice job with it. But as you mentioned, you know, we would have lost probably some of the original rock walls, and you would have lost some of that feel of, wow, those stones have been there since the 1700s. And so it's nice to see that. And, and that it was sort of a mix of restored and, and still original. So that's one thing he brought up. And he's kind of glad that the CCC ran out of time and got disbanded before it was done. The other thing that he mentioned that I thought was interesting is you said that the, the some of the tribes would come in, the natives would come in and live there. But they kind of took advantage of the missions because, you know, when the weather was bad and the crops weren't ready and, there, you know, there wasn't a lot of food, they were found in the mission. But... When the weather got nice and it was time to head out and do their thing, they kind of left yeah. and then they would come back <laughs> later. And, and uh, you know, the, the mission was there for them and the idea was they would convert them to Catholicism. And I don't know what their success rate was on that because the population came and went from the mission a lot based on what was going on with the weather and the climate at the time. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it, it, I'm not sure. I think the Spanish missions as a whole, I mean, they might have, have they obviously had a big impact on early Mexican and Texan history in, in the area. But yeah, specifically with this particular tribe, they were definitely not successful because those folks moved on. They were really only there to take advantage of the food and the shelter. They, they, I mean, they probably, they went to daily chapel, but they never really converted like they expected them to. <laughs> this particular mission was basically abandoned by the early mid 1800s, whether it was due to disease or war or the natives just deciding to move on, that they'd had enough of you know, the life in the mission. And so it was, and then it sat abandoned for years. And, and the locals actually came and took the rocks and started building their own homes in town with the rocks from the mission. So by the time the CCC boys came in the thirties, there really was hardly anything left of it. Um, but, but now you can go visit and, you know, kind of get a glimpse of what life might've been like, you know, at the mission during the 1700s. If you want to get an idea of what happens to these missions, if no one comes in and restores them, a few miles down the road is Mission Rosario, and we did find that eventually, but there's not really much left of that. No, and it is pretty well fenced in, so you can't go climb in the ruins or see any of it, but it really is nothing but just the foundation and a little bit of a wall left, and that's essentially what the CCC boys walked into, but yeah, couple miles away, I think it's like four or five miles away, kind of out in the country, um, up a hill, you'll find Mission Rosario. And um, yeah, I think it's just worth a visit just to get the contrast of what an unimproved mission from that time period looked like. And again, just to think about how long those stones have sat there. I mean, they've really been there since like the mid 1700s. And that's just crazy to think about. It is interesting to stand there and, and look at those ruins. And although it is just the foundations, the state has put a map up that kind of shows you the layout of what the mission would have looked like at the time. And you kind of just stand there and, and sort of look out at the view and take it all in and think about the history of it. It, it is kind of neat. Now, we've mentioned the CCC a number of times, and we talked about how they had to be trained to reconstruct the, the other mission as it would have been done at that time. And what's really interesting is what is now known as the Custodian's Cottage is... Uh, in town near, it's part of the state park. It's a little ways from where the campground and stuff is, but you should certainly go and see that because we went and visited that and, and the volunteer who was working that day said it's it's not visited enough. Like he really wishes more people would come see it. And there's some super interesting things about that building that you're not gonna see elsewhere. So you really should check that out. I'm standing in what is now the visitor center for Goliad State Park. And what's really unique about this is it sort of was the training grounds uh, and the practice area for the CCC who helped reconstruct and rebuild uh, the mission that, you know, that's here at the park. And, and once it was done, it sort of became the caretaker's house. But what's really unique about this is because the CCC boys were learning as they went, woodworking techniques, wrought iron techniques, every little faction of this house is different. One window has a really ornate plaster design in it. There are eight different door styles. There's a wooden staircase made out of two logs. Uh, literally every window, every floor, every ceiling part is very different in this house because the boys were having to learn how to build and construct all of these techniques that then they were going to use to recreate the mission. Um, and so it's just, it's just very historically fabulous <laughs> to make up some new words about what they were able to do um, and then translate that work. And then this this was used sort of as the caretaker superintendent's house for many years. And, and now it's the visitor center. And so you can come in here and read all about the history and how they ended up constructing everything. But, you know, definitely if you come to Goliad State Park, make sure to visit this so you really get a true appreciation of the work that went into the reconstruction. After you visit the mission, your next stop really needs to be the Presidio, which is directly across the river. Now it is not run by the state park, it is operated independently, but at the time they were built together. So a Presidio is a Spanish fort that was often built in conjunction with these Spanish missions, sort of as the protector of the missions. And so in this case, they're directly across the river, one on one side of the San Antonio River and one on the other. This particular Presidio plays a major role in the Texas Revolution. Um, so long after it was abandoned by the Spanish, it be, kind of became used as a fort um, for both the Mexican and the Texas military who kept taking it over, you know, during other various battles. I mentioned at the beginning that Goliad is a small town, but it plays a big part in history. And 
everyone is familiar with the rallying cry of remember the Alamo. What most people don't realize is there's actually two parts to that rallying cry. And it is remember the Alamo, remember Goliad. And that is because of the massacre that happened at this Presidio in Goliad. If you don't know your Texas history, and why would you unless you actually live in Texas? But I know everybody knows, most everybody knows the Alamo. But again, like you said, this is the second major part of that. Texas Colonel James Fannin and 350 troops were holed up at the Presidio about the same time frame as the Battle of the Alamo. And after the Alamo fell, they were actually called to retreat and everybody was going to regroup. Well, on their way to retreat, they were ambushed by the Mexican army. And after a almost two day battle out in the middle of a field, they surrendered under the premise that they would be taken prisoner of war and they were gonna go back to the Presidio and be held captive. Well, things didn't exactly work out the way they planned. General Santa Ana, who at this time was the president of Mexico, had decided that anyone fighting on the Texas side in the Texas Revolution uh, were not part of a country. So therefore they were pirates and should be treated as pirates. And so they were not gonna be treated as prisoners of war. And instead he ordered their execution at the Presidio. This was pretty much not in line with anybody else's way of thinking. I mean, Santa Ana was brutal. I mean, look what happened at the Alamo. And if you read any other parts of the battle, I mean, Santa Ana, it was, he was not a good leader and, and many did not like him. And so this execution was very uncalled for. And even the folks that he, that had to carry out the execution didn't necessarily agree with it, but orders are orders. And so, yeah, 350 men were very brutally massacred within and outside the walls of the fort. And and then they were just sort of left there. And it wasn't until, gosh, was it months, we weeks later, other members of the Texas military who eventually came through that area were able to round up all the bodies and put them in a mass grave, which today is marked with a very nice memorial to Fannin and his troops. It is a nice memorial and it is walking distance from the Presidio. So when you're there, you definitely take that walk and, and go see that and, and pay your respects to those men. And, and they played, you know, their deaths played a major part in Texas history because remember the Alamo, remember Goliad became the rallying cry that got the Texas army together and, and eventually allowed them to defeat Santa Ana at the Battle of San Jacinto. So you know, without all of this, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's so sad and devastating, but the, the Alamo and what happened at Goliad got everybody fired up to the point where they just said, this is enough of Santa Ana, we are done. And Texas is now Texas because of that. Yes. So yeah, I think that, that it's definitely worth a visit. There is there is a small cost to visit the Presidio uh, because it is a private run venture, um, but definitely worth it and the memorial as well, because you really pull a lot of history together, even if, um, because then it just led to a lot of then what became part of U.S. history, too. So even though at the time Texas was was its own country, right, its own thing, it's just a very crucial part of history in general for, for a lot of the area. You do have to pay an admission fee to get into the Presidio, but the Fannin Memorial is free. You can just walk out and see that. And also about 10 miles away is the Fannin Battlefield. So the Battle of Calido Creek, as it's known, is where that initial battle happened where they held out for a couple of days before they ended up needing to surrender. And in addition to just being able to see the battlefield and the area where it all occurred, there's a small museum there that, that really tells the story of what happened over those two days. There's some artifacts from archeological digs that they've done in that area. And for me, it was good to do that because it, it gives you the perspective and it just helped bring it all together in some context when you see the, the Presidio and then the battlefield. And I think it was worth the drive out there. A third famous thing about Goliad is its connection to Cinco de Mayo. And if you've ever wondered why we celebrate Cinco de Mayo, because it's not Mexico's Independence Day and it's not just about tacos and margaritas. But Cinco de Mayo celebrates a major battle in Mexico's war for independence. And on that day, General Zaragoza happened to defeat the French. Now, again, what's that connection to Goliad? It's because General Zaragoza was born in Goliad in a small little building just outside that Presidio wall in the little town that had sprung up around the Presidio and the mission. So today they've sort of reconstructed that building. I mean, it's really not impressive, but there is a small museum there that tells about his life, the life of the, that time, the history of Cinco de Mayo, and, and sort of the Texas 
or sorry, the, the Mexican independence, not to be confused with the Texas independence. And so again, not super impressive, but the town really takes that history to heart and they have a small local Cinco de Mayo festival every year celebrating General Zaragoza and his birthplace and his part in the history. And outside that museum, just a short walk, there's actually a huge statue of him <laughs> to Zaragoza. So they take that very seriously. They're very proud of that native son there in Goliad. And it, it's just the whole town is there's just so much history. If you're into history, whether it's there, there's Spanish history, Mexican history, there's Native American history because of what the Spanish did when they came in. There's Texas history. It's a lot of history. It could make your head explode if you start to try to take it all in at once. But it was really neat to see that and all of its compact right there in Goliad. It's it's very close together for the most part. I think the Fannin Battlefield is 10 miles out. That's the furthest thing away. Yeah, and if you want to stick closer to home outside of just the, the, the mission and the fort and everything, you can actually go into downtown Goliad. It's very tiny. It's a small courthouse in a, in a courthouse square. But the courthouse has been redone to its like 1860s-ish. There's a couple plaques on the courthouse grounds that talk about some significant events that happened there, including one about the hanging tree, which is this giant live oak on the grounds that they used for executions of people that had done wrong. I mean, essentially, like you were convicted in the courthouse and they basically went out and hung you in the public square. Um, that's just kind of how they conducted business in, you know, 1800s in Texas. <laughs> And it's all connected by a really nice bike path system. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that. I think there's a lot that you can do in that area with walking or biking and, and it's not that far or you can drive it. As I mentioned, we stayed for the weekend at the campground there at the state park and the bike path also connects to the campground. So it's all really well connected. We spent two nights staying at the campground in Goliath State Park. There are actually three separate campground loops, I guess you'd call them. Uh, there's a main section right up at the front by the visitor center. It's all pull through sites, full hookup, uh, modern bathrooms. And then there are five, I guess, screened in cabins that you can rent in that section as well. A little bit further down into the park, there's a tent only section that has water spigots, but no electricity. And it's right along the banks of the San Antonio River. And then there's the third section, which is where we stayed. And it has both RV sites, a couple tent sites, but it is probably the strangest campground we have ever stayed at. Um, I, you want to try to explain this? Cause it was just very kind of after it, it was very I mean, it's, it's not hard to picture. <laughs> Think of a giant parking lot and all the way around the outside is where you park. And then over the curb is water and electric hookups for your RVs. And most of the sites uh, have little um, pavilions as well for shade and a picnic table. Right. But but you're literally camping in a parking lot like you are on. Literally, they took a parking lot and they redid the parking line. So you get two parking spaces for each site. And then, yeah, behind you, behind like where, you know, your cement bumpers are is a little grassy area with your pavilion. Um, but you're camping in a parking lot. And I think that the number of people that we watch show up and try to figure out where they were supposed to put their RV and realize, oh, I'm camping in a parking lot. Like you don't have a specific, specific designated like gravel space like you would normally have in a campground um, or like the other full hookup campground was in the other section of the park. So, and it, I mean, it had a modern restroom and it was fine. It was a little out old and outdated. There's only like one shower stall in there. It worked for two nights and it was quiet. It was dark. So I don't really have any complaints, but it's not your typical camping state park experience, I guess. If if you are self-contained, it would be great. I, it was a little rough relying on that bathroom. I think yeah. if you had a, the bathroom's pretty old and needs to be redone, at least in that campground that we were at campground. It's, I, it's, <laughs> it's, it's called a camping area, but it's essentially it a parking lot. I think what I'm going to remember about the Goliad trip was we had a really odd campground. We had a really odd mix of history and there was a lot of it. So it was it was worth the trip. I'm glad we went. But it's just kind of funny how all these things sort of came together in one little location. And, and the oddities of all of that is what I'm going to remember about that trip. But it was a good time. <laughs> It was also like 100 degrees the weekend we visited. But just by accident, and we did not plan this when we went because we didn't even know about it, we ended up there the weekend of Cinco de Mayo. So we went to that little local festival, and I mean local festival. It was like like four food trucks and some live band and, and a, little, you know, a beer stand, and that was about it. But they did have the General Zaragoza teen pageant so that you could be you know queen of the Zaragoza festival. Um, 
but it's kind of fun to experience those kinds of things as well and, and get your mix of history and really feel the passion of those people that live in that town for the history and for their uh, relatives and the generations that came before them. I mean, I think that that's a big part of participating in something like that and then really getting a true appreciation for the history in the, in the area. And there weren't many food trucks at that festival, but the Mexican food was authentic and really good. So <laughs> it was very good. that was worth going in. And that's like when we travel, we talk about go see these historic places and these great campgrounds and hiking sites. But sometimes it's about finding those local festivals and getting to know the local people and getting to know kind of what drives a community. That's a, a special part of travel. And I think that's that's why we do it as well. And we would encourage you to do that. Get out and see the official state parks and the national parks, but also head into town. Check out these little communities. Talk to the people. Get to know the locals and the local festivals and just enjoy yourselves. Get out there when you can and get everywhere you can. Keep on trekking. And we'll see you out there.